Hey everybody, this is John with another installment of Think Culture. And today I'm going to be talking about Giorgio Agamben. He's one of the most important and influential thinkers, uh, uh, philosophers of the last few decades, one of the most important that are still living. He's on the left. He was a big influence on people like Michael Hart, whose book Empire I have a video on. If you're interested, check that out. It's about uh, globalization, the idea of the multitude. Slavoj Žižek uh, said of Empire that it's um, the new Das Kapital. But, um, uh, yeah, so Agamben's very important, and he has this book, State of Exception, which I read, and I have. And this book and the idea is important to what we're talking about today. The basic idea there is uh, the books in dialogue with Carl Schmitt, who's a very interesting uh, thinker. From him we get, like, the idea of political theology, that all politics, um, political concepts are secularized theological concepts. We get the friend-enemy distinction. Uh, and we get this idea that sovereignty resides in whoever decides on the state of exception. So basically, under normal circumstances, situations are covered by the law. The law tells you what, to, what can be done, what to do. But there are always events that occur that require extra legal decision making. And in cases where the law doesn't provide gu guidance or when there's like a situation that requires action for which the deliberative mechanisms of the law would be too slow... Uh, etc., uh, you know, an exception is declared, right? You have to decide on this exception. And so basically, that person or that institution has sovereignty in the society, and they step in where the law can't, they suspend the legal process, and, you know, they act swiftly, unilaterally. Uh, he has another book, Homo Soccer, uh, which is his magnum opus, and in it he talks about things like this idea of bare life, etc. I haven't had a chance to read that yet, but I know a little bit about it and about that concept. Uh, it comes up in what we're talking about today, too. And it relates to Foucault and his idea of biopolitics. Um, but the idea here is that uh, people get reduced to their zoological dimension. Human life is pared down to its lowest biological element. Human life without a concern for the quality of life, you know, for the, for the social or political dimension that makes life human life, really. Um, so the person, this person, the bare life, the homo soccer, they're excluded from the legal order. The idea goes back to Roman law, I think, uh, such that this person can be murdered without it being a crime. They have no protection, they have no participation in religio, they've been expelled from the community. And I think he's also thinking of like Hannah Arendt and uh, like the Aristotelian idea that man is a political animal. So when you're outside of the polis, um, you know, you're outside of the civic order, you're reduced to sort of mere animality. You're no longer really human. You no longer have status as an ethical subject. And he thinks primarily, um, he thinks about this primarily in the context of like refugees or terrorists that are detained indefinitely without charge, etc. So these two ideas of homo soccer, bare life, and um, the state of exception, they obviously relate to one another. If the juridical order is suspended and a state of exception is declared, then life in the state of exception is without protection. Anything can be done to you, right? Um, but any, but Giorgio Agamben right now is in danger of cancellation, um, despite how important he's been uh, on the left. And there's been a lot of antipathy towards him recently all of a sudden. Um, I had sort of heard about it and this controversy before that he said some controversial stuff about coronavirus and the lockdowns. Um, but I didn't really look into it. I saw more about it recently, and so I decided to check it out. And that's what we're talking about. So he has a bunch of stuff published on this blog, uh, Quad Libet, uh, which I guess means a topic for or exercise in philosophical or theological discussion. And they're all in Italian, but the auto-translate on Chrome seems to be working pretty well now. Uh, seems to have gotten better recently. And there's like 15 or 20 of them. Uh, so I translated and read them all. And I want to talk a bit about what he says. Uh, to be frank, I've tended to be pretty pro-lockdown, pro-taking coronavirus seriously, pro-mask, etc. Uh, although I've never really been like dogmatic or aggressive about it, obviously. That's just sort of not the way that I do things. But uh, I've been kind of softening on my position. And then reading all of what Agamben had to say, I think his argument is pretty persuasive. And that the situation we're in with the lockdowns is actually pretty disturbing and dangerous. Uh, so what's he saying? Uh, I'll basically treat all of these, you know, there's like 15 or 20 the very short pieces. I'm sort of treating all of them as one thing. But remember that it's actually coming from a, a bunch of separate sort of short essays 
that don't necessarily connect well or follow, follow from one another. So I'm trying to put it all together into sort of one argument, but that's definitely not how it was written. Okay, so keep that in mind. But so uh, he's really th he's really thinking beyond like the question of whether this is a real medical emergency or anything like that. He thinks such short-sighted analyses just won't do. Serious thought has to consider whether these are signs and symptoms of a new paradigm of government, uh, of the government of men and things. Uh, he talks about, for example, how war has bequeathed to peace many technologies, from barbed wire to nuclear power. Western states have been experimenting with states of exception for a long time. This is what his book, State of Exception, is about. And the trend has been increasing uh, its use, uh, even like toward permanentizing it. The excuse has for a while been things like, I said, the fear of terrorism. He says the pandemic seems to provide an even better pretext for the state of exception. A public health emergency, something like a virus, they're unbeatable, right? There's no possibility of, of victory. And the enemy is always getting stronger, in fact. It's an ever-present threat. It's hard to detect. Uh, it could be in anyone. You know, the potential for devastation is actually much greater than with uh, normal terrorism. Uh, the forms of social control, this is the important part, that would be needed to secure us against that threat are much more severe. So while commentators have talked about the development of the security state for a while, Agamben's fear is that the pandemic and our response to it actually presages a much more dire threat that he refers to as the biosecurity state. A development, he says, is a paradigm of governance whose effectiveness far exceeds that of all forms of government that the political history of the West has so far known. He talks about how some people are speculating about the end of bourgeois democracy. They have been for a while. Uh, so these are states founded on rights, parliaments, a division of powers. And he suggests that uh, this is actually giving way to a new despotism that as regards the pervasiveness of controls and the cessation of all political activity will be much worse than the totalitarianisms we've known so far. Citing security reasons, uh, the security state or... Uh, uh, you know, for reasons of public health, the biosecurity state imposes any limit on individual freedoms via emergency decree. With the technologies that we possess in terms of video cameras, mobile phones, etc., the state apparatus can engage in social control far exceeding that of, for example, the Nazi regime. And the justification will be that the loss of all these freedoms, the loss of anything that we might call a distinctly human form of existence, reducing us to homo soccer, is really justified by an abstract reference to health security. And he says, uh, potentially even a fictitious reference to health security. He talks about the work of the health historian Patrick Zilberman, who even uh, several years ago had written a book, I guess, talking about how health security has become an increasing part of essential national and international political strategies. The idea of a kind of health terror as a tool of governments that uh, operates via the logic of the worst. In 2005, the World Health Organization, he says, had announced that the avian flu would cause something uh, between two and 150 million deaths. And so they suggested some of these extreme measures to various states as a response, you know, based on that maximum figure. So he says that the, this device is sort of divided into three points, right? One is on the basis of a possible risk, a fictitious scenario imagined, the data are presented in such a way so as to favor behaviors allowing for the governing of an extreme situation. Two, the logic of the worst is adopted as a regime of political rationality, like we anticipate dangers and ensure a priori that in the worst case scenario security would still be maintained. And three uh, is a little hard to read <laughs> with the translation. Uh, but it seems to be something like the state's organization of the social body such that the citizens are given new legal obligations based on the idea of managing health risks. So quoting uh, Lewis Bulk, he's suggesting that the development of human society is based in some sense on the progressive inhibition of, of natural processes that are dangerous or injurious to us via technological prostheses and the like, eventually gets to a point where it becomes counterproductive and even self-destructive of human beings as a species. He's worried that the current situation 
uh, biotechnologies, biosecurity, surveillance technologies, etc., is an example of this, and that the medicine which is supposed to cure all of our ills is producing a greater evil that should be resisted by all means available to us. So he talks a little bit about the freedoms that we've lost, um, that we've given up, in fact, and how previously such a restriction of our freedoms would have been unimaginable. Uh, but like how our movement is actually restricted uh, even more than it was in the world wars. We've given up our social relationships, work, religious and political activities. Schools are closed. The neighbor has been abolished. And we're supposed to social distance. He meditates on this uh, a bit and asks why it is social and not personal or physical. Uh, he thinks that ultimately it's a kind of euphemism for confinement. Uh, we've given up, in short, all of our normal living conditions. He thinks that the worst part of this is that our relationships with one another deteriorate. The other person, even a loved one, you know, we're supposed to be wary of and keep our distance. Our friendships and affections have been sacrificed. Our contact is limited to only digital communications. We have, he argues, crossed the Rubicon from humanity to barbarism. Because uh, not since Antigone have we burned our dead without funeral. And now we do. By the way, these are written over a several month period. Um, you know, starting like in January or February. Uh, in short, the state of exception predicated on the current public health emergency reduces us to bare life. We accept all these restrictions for fear of the only thing that remains to us, our bare life. Human life in the age of coronavirus and the state of exception, justified uh, with reference to a public health threat, is stripped of all of its social, political, and even personal character. And we agreed to it. He says the fact that we agreed to it shows that our society no longer believes in anything but bare life. We're willing to sacrifice our friendships, relationships, work, political convictions, religious convictions, and everything else simply to avoid falling ill because we are concerned only for bare life and the possibility of losing it. We accepted these measures so easily because in some sense the plague was always already with us. Being bound together only by fear and the commitment to mere survival, he says, can't be something that unites people. It can only separate them. What, he asks, happens to human relationships in a country that gets used to living like this? What is a society that has no value other than survival? And we're being told constantly that some of these measures are going to continue indefinitely. That this is a problem uh, and a kind of problem that isn't going away that the social distancing will have to continue, that some of these practices like mask wearing uh, maybe should continue, not shaking hands, etc. Officials are telling us these things directly. He wants to know what kind of political order could be founded on something like social distancing. And he thinks that such a community is, is neither humanly nor politically livable. And he thinks then that uh, we've really failed by accepting these restrictions then and that it's a huge issue. But in particular, he wants to blame the clergy and the jurists. He rails against the Catholic Church, saying that they've given up their mission and become the handmaidens of science, which he calls the true religion of our time, and says that it's renounced most essential, its most essential principles, the Church has. He says they've forgotten, under a pope named Francis, that Francis embraced lepers, that one of the works of mercy is to visit the sick, that martyrs must be willing to sacrifice life before faith, and that to renounce one's neighbor is, in fact, a renunciation of one's faith. So this is a complete abnegation of the church's duty to care for the dignity of man. The jurist, too, he says, we have long been accustomed to the reckless use of urgent decrees through which the executive power actually replaces the legislative one, abolishing the principle of separation of powers that defines democracy. This is state of exception. But in this case, every limit has been exceeded, and one gets the impression that the words of the prime minister and the head of civil protection uh, have, as, as was said for those of the Fuhrer, immediately the force of law. And it is not clear how, once the limit of temporal validity of the urgent decrees has been exhausted, the limitations of freedom can be maintained, as is announced. Uh, it is the task of the jurists to verify that the rules of the Constitution are respected, but the jurists are silent abolishing that principle of the separation of powers. Uh, so they too, the jurists, have failed in their duty to defend us. The media too has failed us through the manipulation of, of information, data that's being given out, important pieces of data that are, are being withheld, etc. Um, and through failing to keep, to, to hold power accountable. 
So this is all related to a kind of general process in the West that he talks about as a, as a kind of conflict between three great religions in our culture, those being Christianity, capitalism, and science. And he says that the total victory of science as our major religion is clear. Uh, it doesn't concern, he says, theory and uh, general principles so much now as the practice of worship. Its sphere of worship coincides with what we call technology. And the main protagonist for science here, he says, is, is it, it dogmatically weaker, but pragmatically stronger. Uh, and that's medicine, whose immediate object is the living body. Uh, it's Manichaean, uh, with disease representing evil and healing being the good, not health. This is important, healing. Uh, the agents of the good are doctors and therapeutics. Uh, and the cultic practice, which was... Um, like every liturgy before, episodic, limited, it has now become pervasive and permanent. We no longer talk about taking this medicine or that and exam a surgery to resolve a particular discrete problem, but our whole lives now have become the site of worship. Right now, worship is not free and voluntary during our lockdown, even. It's, it's mandated by law. He remarks that we can tell that this is what's going on because the number one killer is cardiovascular disease. And we've known forever that certain habits and a certain diet could decrease the incidence of cardiovascular disease and uh, death dramatically. But it never occurred to us or to the doctors to mandate this form of life and transform our entire existence into a health obligation. That's what is now occurring. The other two religions gave up without a fight. The church denied its own principles, and capitalism accepted major losses in productivity that previously would have been unimaginable. Our, uh, they're accepting massive state intervention and economic processes. They're accepting businesses being closed down, etc. So the medical religion is particularly potent because it combines the capitalist idea of perpetual crisis. Um, because health risks are omnipotent, viruses are always mutating, etc. With the idea of preventive medicine... Uh, uh, with the Christian idea of an ultimate moment where the outcome is decided, um, uh, an eschaton, right? The extreme decision is always in process. The end is either precipitated or delayed through our actions, but it requires a constant attempt at intervention by which it, you know, it can never be really fully resolved. It's the religion, he says, of a world that feels at the end and yet is unable to decide whether it shall live or die. It offers no final salvation or redemption. Healing can only be temporary, and the ultimate evil, disease, is constantly reformulating and becoming riskier and riskier. He talks about how the word, word, word epidemic is fundamentally political, coming from Homer, uh, like a, a crisis of the demos, right, uh, on the people. It refers to civil war, basically. And we're in a civil war, he says, a war against an enemy that resides potentially in every one of us and all of our neighbors. He says, according to the most attentive political scientists, this has taken the place of traditional world wars. All nations and people now are permanently at war with themselves, struggling with enemies within. Whether the dogmatics of this dominant religion, he says, will light the fires again and start burning books is unclear. But certainly the heretics and dissenters are being silenced and attacked. And now he's being canceled, which is interesting. Uh, the control of information is total. He says... As in all moments of emergency, real or simulated, the ignorant will again be seen slandering philosophers um, and scoundrels trying to profit from the misfortunes they themselves have caused. This has happened already and will continue to happen. Uh, so that's sort of the argument contained in all of these essays. I hope that, that was interesting. Uh, for me, yeah, it's definitely changed my mind a bit. It's made me more alert to the attendant risks. The real question is, and he, and he brings this up, like whether or not we might be talking about something that is just a temporary emergency situation after which all these changes will be reversed. And I think he's right that that's highly unlikely uh, and naive. We can talk about the degree to which then the changes will be permanent, but as he points out, officials are definitely talking about an indefinite extension of things like social distancing we might be looking at permanent changes in terms of things like telework, uh, online education, and we've been sort of moving in that direction anyway. Yeah, this, so this is kind of like just an acceleration of events. Uh, if, that's, if that is the drift, 
um, of history for us, and we're witnessing this grand experimentation. I mean, to some degree, this is the future we're talking about, right? And I think he's right that we're talking about a form of social control which is more pervasive and draconian, potentially, than any that we've ever seen before. And we ought to be thinking about it. We ought to be considering very carefully what we're accepting. And so far, we haven't been. Um, I hadn't been. <laughs> uh, as a kind of final thought, I wanted to leave you with... Um, with uh, this quote from him, which you know is filtered through Chrome, but uh, after politics have been replaced by economics, now this too, in order to govern, will have to be uh, replaced with the new biosecurity paradigm, to which all other needs will have to be sacrificed. It is legitimate to ask whether such a society can still define itself as human, or whether the loss of sensitive relationships, of the face of friendships, of love, can truly be compensated for by an abstract and presumably completely fictitious health security. Remember, don't simply react, but think culture.